There are three PARP inhibitors approved for ovarian cancer at this point, olaparib, rocuparib, and niraparib. The dosing is different between those uh, PARP inhibitors. Rocuparib is dosed at 600 milligrams per mouth, BID. Olaparib is given at 300 milligrams, P-O-B-I-D. Those are 150 milligrams tablets that were just approved by the FDA, both for treatment of BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers with ovarian cancers and maintenance setting. And niraparib is the only PARP inhibitor that is dosed only once a day. And we uh, dose it uh, initially at 300 milligrams a day. That's a starting, recommended starting dose to be taken at uh, about the same time uh, uh, on a daily basis. The uh, dosing at this point is continuous. We don't have any data that uh, suggests that we can stop PARP inhibitors unless patients have side effects that are not tolerable or patients progress with a disease. We uh, do have dose modification, modification <coughs> recommendations that can easily be uh, obtained uh, by the package inserts. The initial, uh, I think, administration has to be monitored very carefully by the uh, providers, by the physicians and the nurse practitioners who are ever is involved in the care. It's important to inform the patients about potential side effect and about the likelihood of having to dose modify any of these PARP inhibitors. The mechanism of action of the three different PARP inhibitors are uh, notably different. Um, as far as how they interact uh, with uh, the different PARP molecules. Um, clinically, this is not overly relevant. Um, there may be differences in PARP trapping and some of the theoretic differences in mechanism. This may be borne out more in the side effect profile and toxicity, um, perhaps slightly also in efficacy where uh, with differences in potency. Um, this also may lead to slightly different uh, need for dose reductions and dose strategy. And I think probably if we look at uh, Olaparib, uh, it's complicated by the fact we had capsules initially, now we have tablets. Uh, those tablets are a more potent uh, you know, milligram to milligram difference um, than the capsules, so we want to be sure not to substitute uh, on a one-to-one -one basis with those capsules. Uh, or with, I'm sorry, with the, with the capsules to the now tablet. That's what most people are using. And in fact, the capsules are mostly are re disappearing from the market at this point. Um, Olaparib itself, when we look at the mechanism of action, uh, we see fairly standard side effects. It has a unique side effect of slightly elevating the creatinine, uh, which does not seem to cause a detriment in renal function, but a definite lab abnormality. And this is kind of a unique uh, feature. Um, we've also mentioned the niraparib having that effect on the platelet count. It is one that probably uh, the, the dose is a, a, a bit high in that we have a large amount of those patients, at least a third of the patients end up with dose reduction uh, to where they ultimately end up on their final dose. Uh, Rucaparib, uh, we do have some uh, unique side effects and elevation of the transaminases. Um, but as far as clinically meaningful differences, they typically all have side effects as anemia and fatigue and nausea, which are things that we can fight. Um, Niraparib does have a little bit of unique increased uh, risk of uh, elevation of the blood pressure where patients can actually feel sometimes palpitations. Um, and that is borne out in the mechanism of that drug having a little bit of beta-mimetic beta effects. All of the PARP inhibitors have different toxicities. Olaparib is known to increase creatinine in about 44% of patients who receive the drug. Rucaparib has been shown to increase creatinine in about 92% and also tends to increase AST and ALT in approximately 75% of patients. Now, the increase in creatinine for both Olaparib and Rucaparib is thought to occur through inhibition of the MATE1, MATE2, and OCT1. The increase in creatinine uh, does not tend to have a clinical significance. It does improve over time, and the estimated GFR remains high. The increase in ALT and AST that occurs with rucaparib um, is also not thought to have a significant clinical um, significance. It turns to normalize as you continue to treat with the drug, 
and we don't typically see an increase in total bilirubin or aqualon phosphatase um, with this. With niraparib, the things uh, that we think about most are uh, the 30% increase in grade three or four thrombocytopenia. There's also about a 9% increase in grade three or four hypertension. Now, the thrombocytopenia tends to occur early. It occurs usually around cycle one, day 23, and there is a very good treatment algorithm as to how to manage thrombocytopenia with dose interruption and dose reduction. And through the mechanism of interrupting and reducing um, the dose of the drug, patients' platelets recover back to normal and there don't tend to be any further problems with thrombocytopenia as you continue treatment. So the different PARP inhibitors um, are metabolized in different ways. So rucaparib and olaparib are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. Rucaparib is metabolized by the CYP2D6, and it also induces and inhibits other CYP enzymes, but there are no known drug-drug interactions at this time. For olaparib, the, the, the drug is metabolized by the CYP3A4 and CYP3A5 enzymes. Now, it's really important with this drug to recognize that other drugs that a patient might take that are either CYP3A inducers or inhibitors um, can interact with olaparib. So olaparib needs to be dose adjusted in this setting. Now, niraparib is actually metabolized by carboxyl esterases and is not affected by the CYP3 system. And so there are no drug-drug interactions that are known.